My name is Shrikant Srinivasan and I, along with Devdat and Nutan, we are co-organizing this uh, workshop here. Uh, so I thought I would give a short introduction to our esteemed panel of speakers. So many of us uh, know these people already, but maybe some of us don't, and people in the wider world deserve to know. So I thought uh, just a few short words. But we have many burning issues to discuss, so this is going to be short. So let me start from the right. So we have here uh, Professor Madhusudan, who's at uh, Harvard University. Uh, he's an, uh, he got his uh, PhD from UC Berkeley. Uh, he's an expert in many areas, including coding theory and the hardness of approximation. And uh, he's won uh, many prizes, uh, including the Nevin Lena Prize. Uh, so next to Madhu is uh, Professor Shubhangi Saraf from the University of Toronto. Uh, so she got a PhD from MIT. Uh, she's uh, a kind of a pioneer in areas like algebraic complexity, coding theory, and many others. Uh, uh, next to her, we have uh, Professor Johan Hostad, who's a professor at KTH in Stockholm. Uh, he's um, an expert in many, many areas, including circuit complexity, hardness of approximation, and he's won, among other prizes, the Gerdel Prize. Uh, and uh, here we have Professor Amir Shpilka from Tel Aviv University. Uh, Amir got his PhD from uh, the Hebrew University. Am I right, Amir? Yeah, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, he's, again, an expert, an amazing expert in many areas, including algebraic complexity, pseudo-randomness, and many other things. So yeah, that's a short introduction to all the experts. I could uh, speak for an hour on the amazing work they've done, but uh, I'm guessing you don't want me to, so I'll stop here and let Nutan take over. Thanks a lot, Shrikant. Um, so yeah, uh, we are here for a panel discussion with these um, amazing panelists. And uh, as a qualifier, let me start by saying that in theory CS, we don't do such things often, right? So as a result, as a moderator, I'm not going to be an expert at this. And perhaps the panelists will also need your help. So uh, with that, uh, quantifier, already quantified. Uh, let me get started. Um, so today, uh, and why are we not typically used to panel discussions? So recently, actually, a wonderful panel discussion was uh, done by Ido here in the audience. And um, uh, that was my first experience of theory CS people speaking at, uh, about general things. And then recently at Stock, I think there was a wonderful panel discussion. So this is a trend, maybe changing, maybe because also theory CS is changing a bit. So what we will try to uh, do today is kind of try to discuss issues related to this. Uh, so just as a historical perspective, maybe I'll get your opinions on um, what do you think have been important issues that came up in theory CS in the last couple of decades? So uh, in terms of uh, results and theorems, not general issues, but uh, what are your favorite things that happened or could have happened but didn't, things like this. Yep. I think there is like a, one mic for, oh, yeah. So should we go about this? In, in yeah, order? whatever. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let, me, uh, let me not give 15 wonderful results that I've liked. Uh, maybe I'll pick one direction that I think has been amazing. Um, then there are many, many, and I'm also hoping that this will sort of seed the conversation for other results that are going to happen. Uh, the one very prominent direction in which our field has been involved in is getting uh, how is finding out how to solve very linear systems extremely fast. There is an entire theory of developing graph theory in order to be able, and uh, numerical analysis methods in order to be able to do linear systems very fast, and when the area worked, I mean, one of the reasons I'm kind of impressed about these things is, you know, how wonderful hindsight is. When this area started, I said, who wants to solve linear systems? Come on, this is, you know, let's at least go for degree two polynomials, right? I mean, that's, that makes sense to this audience. But the folks who worked on this developed a beautiful machinery, a theory, and that went on to solve all kinds of optimization problems, maximum flow, matching, et cetera, et cetera, and just spread around and spread around and were constantly uh, you know, uh, jumping from very interesting theorems to very nice applications and each was driving the other. Eventually this is the thread that led to the resolution of the Caddison-Singer theory, uh, uh, theory, theorem, um, I forget, conjecture. <laughs> um, and I think this path has been beautiful. Uh, one of the things that I love about the world of theoretical computer science is we don't seem to be respecting boundaries and we just keep walking across different terrains and learning from each other and then 
using the last bit of learning to resolve the next problem. And this was one of those uh, developments that really showed us very highly. So I'll turn and stop now and I'll turn this over to Sir Shubhagi. Um, okay, so let me, uh, so one of the results, uh, so let me say that, so algebraic methods, which is the focus of this workshop, and this maybe ties into Madhu's talk, like the use of error correcting codes and uh, algebraic methods and property testing, the way it brought about the PCP theorem and interactive proofs, interactive oracle proofs, maybe what Noga talked about, like what it started out as mathematical curiosities, but then developed into a really beautiful, rich theory, which not only stayed within complexity, it has impacted cryptography very heavily and, um, and even applied cryptography and things that started off really purely as mathematical curiosities have had real world applications beyond uh, complexity and beyond theoretical computer science. And I think that's a great example of, uh, again, a, a success story for theoretical computer science. Like just fundamental basic research having reach then beyond the area, I think is a great example of, um, a, a great example of a success story for algebraic complexity theory. Thanks. Thanks. Well, this is getting harder and harder, but if I, I'm, I'm going to, something in, that I personally like is sort of cryptography. I was working in cryptography a long time ago, but then I sort of gave up on that area and thought that, you know, now we have done all the basic theories, you know, can theory contribute more? And now, and one of these eternal dreams of cryptography was homomorphic encryption, where you can actually, you know, encrypt things and... Uh, and I thought this would be impossible, you know. You read all these papers and there's, you know, the, the holy grail of cryptography is homomorphic encryption. And now it's actually happening. So I think that the point is that we have to continue trying and eventually the, the breakthroughs will come. But even, you know, we might have to wait decades and sometimes it happens. Okay, so um, I'll say probably the same things, but uh, I think um, at least... I think that in the last decade or so, we've seen more and more sophisticated mathematical tools entering the field, especially algebraic complexity with uh, representation theory, more algebraic geometry. That's on the one end. On the other end, the contribution of computer science to mathematics also are also amazing. The cartesian zinger conjecture, the Kohn-Zambendik theorem, um, all the construction of i-dimensional expanders leading to new questions uh, in topology and many other things. Um, so just the level of sophistication is getting kind of amazing. And another thing is that it's related to what Jon said, is that like the extremely fast PCPs and zero knowledge proofs that Eli Ben-Sasson, for example, is using uh, in the real world, in practice. So it seems that even our non-practical results are becoming practical, at least some of them. And uh, that's also unexpected, at least from my perspective. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, but I don't think we should be so optimistic that we always get practical results of other impractical things. But it happens surprisingly often, is my view. Yeah. Far from more, always, though. Yeah, so, what's your bet about homomorphic encryption? Uh, it seems like it's working. Oh, fast. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I. I. I, I don't know. But uh, I, I think we will have practical applications from it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I mean that really is something I wanted to. So. I asked them what the best things that happened in theory, and somehow, very organically, everybody spoke of something that has also touched the results that have affected, affected things outside of theory, right? And this sort of, I think, is something that we all strive for somewhere. Though we are all people doing theory, who just appreciate doing theory for the beauty of it, for the uh, elegance of it, for the absolute truth of the matters, uh, for, for discovering absolute truths of the matter, we kind of aspire also to somehow have a theory have effect on things outside of us. So uh, based on this, I was wondering whether you have any thoughts about, for example, um, in the next 10 years, would you like say that, oh, this may happen? Um, something that has, I mean, it's a tricky question, I guess, to put you at a spot like this, but um, based on what we know, how theory has uh, evolved, do you see uh, something that you thought about or something that uh, you hoped would happen, happens next? You, you, you 
I don't want to, I don't have a concrete thing in mind, but what I remember from the last 20 years of working in the area of error correcting codes, and in particular locality. So locality is this idea where you're looking at codes involving massive amounts of data, but you sort of do some, a little bit of random sampling and verify some big properties true, like, oh, there haven't been too many errors, or if there have been a lot of errors, I only want this bit, I can recover it. In this area, I have made lots and lots of predictions, and all of them have come false. <laughs> so all of them, I mean, I was willing to bet that there would be absolutely no locally decodable codes which would, you know, be of any interest that would uh, influence, uh, I mean, which would be quantitatively sublinear amounts of queries, and then Shubhangi disproved that uh, conjecture. Uh, and then we were willing to say, oh, yeah, theory people were going to be thinking about this, but who would care? Well, Microsoft was writing these articles saying, oh, the locally decodable work has saved us, you know, n hundred millions of dollars. Um, so I think um, it, it's, I think I just need to find a good uh, thing to sort of stake my uh, <laughs> bet on, but somebody's really watching how much money I'm betting on this, <laughs> and then, you know, acting against me. So it's a, it's a little hard to, uh, to predict in this kind of a adversarial circumstance. And Madhu, just to be sure, like, this is being recorded, so, you know, the <laughs> bets are higher. <laughs> so, so at this moment, I'm not committing to anything under this pressure of cameras. <laughs> It's very hard to predict the future, right? So, uh, but I think that the importance is that, you know, we have lots of good, interesting ideas. And as Madhu was saying in his talk, you know, the, 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 all these polynomial testing that sort of led up to lots of good applications and important theory were sort of done for their mathematical beauty in the first place. So I, I think it's important that we have, you know, lots of people, lots of smart people. We're doing, you know, more and more sophisticated things, and but we should keep talking to the outside, and that good things will come out of this. Yeah. Um, I would say that uh, in algebraic complexity, I would expect uh, advance. Uh, I cannot predict which one, but for example, the recent result of uh, Newton, Shrikant, and uh, Sebastian, uh, it was very surprising to me. Uh, it was even more surprising to see that uh, they didn't need to invent amazingly difficult techniques. So it's just interesting. What can we do with what we know today? Or what, I mean, and algebraic complexity, I think I said it many times in different occasions, I think it's the first step we need to solve before going to the P versus NP. Just so expect that as we advance, more and more people will come, and then more advance will happen, and maybe yeah. we'll be able to do something really interesting. Yeah, yeah. You're asking what is the border of our understanding. <laughs> no, I just want to repeat what Amir said, like algebraic complexity as a field has had really exciting advances in the last 10, 15 years and uh, very surprising. I think this work by Nutan Shrikant and Sebastian was like mind blowing. Like this is, progress has been stuck on this, these questions of lower bounds for a couple of decades and such a beautiful work that came out and just broke the boundaries of what we expected to be easily provable. Like I, it, I thought that the VP versus VNP question is unapproachable or really hard, but I, now my belief in that is shaken. Like I wouldn't be shocked if uh, we will be eventually in the next decade be able to prove it. It's, it wouldn't be a surprise to me anymore. Like it's uh, my belief on what are unapproachable or really hard questions has been shaken by this work and I, I don't know, maybe we will be, be able to be, make great strides in this field. And this is the right audience to say such a thing. I mean, they are just going to go back and <laughs> prove you right, I think. <laughs> maybe I'll just, you know, commit to one direction of questions that's sort of been beautiful and also uh, gives me a good position to stake out and be proven wrong. So it seems like uh, this, uh, in the last, you know, five to 10 years, there's been a lot of work on this meta complexity, people trying to understand the complexity of determining the complexity of functions. And uh, from what I hear, I don't, I'm not an expert, I'm far from an expert in this area. I've been sort of listening to Srikanth and Nutan and learning from everybody. And from what I understand, these, there is a possibility, a hope, in the next 10 to 20 years, we might actually prove 
independence of P versus NP from systems of log uh, axiom. So why don't I bet on that? And if I'm proved wrong, that would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thanks. So this was like unexpectedly amazing uh, conversation and uh, unexpectedly because I thought I'm not going to be um, um, doing what I'm doing now. Right. <laughs> okay, but uh, let's, let's move forward. Um, um, we have to address the elephant in the room, um, which is um, other areas of computer science, uh, right? So we, we function inside this bigger ecosystem where theory CS is subsumed by CS in general. And uh, the recent trends outside of CS, the biggest one right now is uh, machine learning and advances in machine learning and things like this. So actually, when we were trying to conceive this panel discussion, the head of the Department of Computer Science who's here, he threw in a question saying that, you know, theory people find it hard to find students. Uh, and now machine learning uh, is uh, kind of, uh, in every department, one of the strongest department, uh, uh, strongest group uh, attracting lots and lots of money for really good reasons, obviously. Um, in the presence of this sort of, a, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem, how does uh, how do you imagine theory uh, prospering and uh, you know attracting the talent that we've known to attract uh, for last so many decades? Goes to the center of deep learning. <laughs> <laughs> so I so I guess machine learning attracting lots of people is to do with I mean it's. A very, it's a very lucrative field to be in. There are lots of jobs of, to, to, in the field. And uh, I mean, core theory is probably never going to have, I mean, as much interest, interest from industry just because the goals are much more long term. It's not, uh, I mean, the impact is great, but the impact is not a short term impact. And so I think um, maybe it's a much more academic field and mathematical field and it has the potential for profound impact in the long run. And so I think departments need to be aware of this and uh, embrace the fact that theory research, this fundamental research is important research. I find that when I teach interesting theory graduate classes, there are often many students uh, who are very attracted by the beauty of the results they see and they want to work in theory. And often I find myself uh, dissuading students from entering complexity theory because just, I mean, once you finish your PhD, there's just not as many interesting jobs out there as interested students. And I think it's good to be for the rest of the world to become aware that theory is, the contributions of theory are important and have a lot of impact. And I think interested, I mean, there is a lot, there are stu great, very strong students who get naturally attracted because the math is beautiful, the applications are great. And um, I f in fact, I feel like I don't think there's a problem in attracting mathematically talented students to the field. And I wish there would be more um, opportunities for these, uh, for these students when they finish to continue research in this field and more research institutes and more universities who encourage this kind of fundamental research. So I don't think it's a problem. We have to acknowledge that your machine learning is more important in the short term for society than, than theory. But there will be a subset of people that like theory better and, and uh, uh, who knows, you know, what kind of theory, you know, the world is changing quicker and quicker and I, I think, you know, the theory way of thinking will be useful in, in the long run. And I don't see there any problems for our students to get jobs even if they don't want to stay in academia. That's, uh, I'm sure they'll do well. That's, I don't see a problem. Maybe I'm being I optimistic. Yeah. I mean, the people that want to do something that affects reality in the next two years, they're not going to choose theory, but that's, you know, there are people of all kinds and not everybody has that need. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I agree with you on. Actually, in Israel, it's not such a big problem uh, mm. because we have many, many students uh, that like theory. I think part of it is that uh, we teach a lot of math in the first years and then, you know, with a strong math background, they are I mean, some of them, I mean, we can 
show more interesting things in the undergraduate degree, and then more people are, people that have this tendency are more attracted to theory because they know more about what theory is. Uh, but yes, I mean, but my experience is that uh, students that graduated in theory and went to the industry found fantastic jobs in research, probably on machine learning, but, uh, but just their abilities in theory showed people that they can do complicated stuff and uh, that they are smart and uh, that it's worthwhile uh, giving them a research position. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a big problem. And like uh, what Shubangi said, usually when students come to me, I try to warn them, mm -hmm. not uh, attract them, but uh, some of them still don't listen. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, so, I mean, first, let me just say that, you know, look, I'm blown away by the success of large language models and machine learning and the amazing things that they're able to do. They are a challenge, of course, for us to worry about in the future. And there's a whole collection of issues around it. There's definitely lots of opportunities for theory to get involved in these things. I mean, there's a whole collection of projects on fair machine learning, on privacy, on safety in these systems and we can definitely, I mean, and every person, I mean, people who've worked on error correcting codes probably have some opinion about this. People who've worked on cryptography have some opinion about this. Uh, so we should definitely a, not ignore this thing, not worry about this. The big problem that I do see, I, I do see a problem, <laughs> is there is a lot of noise around ML, okay? There's some signal, but also a whole lot of noise the noise is so loud that it's drowning us out. Now, if it turns out that all the students who come in understand the layout of the field, this is what is system building, this is architecture, this is the theory, this is what different areas do, and then choose to work in machine learning, that's great. If they come in, they've heard about nothing but the latest uh, stories out on machine learning and decide to do that and never ever explore theory they are losing out on a lot, we are losing out on something. Not everybody has to do theory, not everybody is going to be good for theory, and nobody, not everybody has got, uh, uh, you know, accepts the same motivations. So we don't want to force anybody, but people should have the right, val uh, you know, right, right information to start with, uh, and then make the best decisions. And I do worry that our ability to, you know, hold a megaphone against this much, much, much bigger enterprise is getting more challenging. And finally, I mean, you know, theory is, like Amir said, like Leon said, Shubangi said, you know, we are not just selling theorems. We are not just here in the market to say, look, here is a theorem that you'll find very useful. We try to tell you how to think about definitions, how to think about inferences, what are some clever ways of reasoning around seeming obstacles. And these are tools and techniques that are going to be, I mean, this mode of thinking is exceptionally powerful. And we have all seen people who have abandoned academia and gone out and done, you know, amazing things in the real world. And at the end, what was making them successful is what was a theoretical skill. So I do hope that at the end, students are able to understand what we are doing. And I think, you know, events like this and some you know, popular talks that we have, talks which talk not just about personalities, but what went into the results, and how did we prove it, and why did we, why was it a bottleneck? These things, the more of them that we are able to see and popularize, the more successful our area is going to be, and the more uh, of an impact we'll have on the rest of society. Yeah, so any rebuttal on yeah, this? I also think that in the last few years there's been uh, connections between differential privacy and machine learning and um, if you want to prove lower bounds on uh, in neural networks and this is kind of, it's, it's uh, some take on algebraic circuit, arithmetic circuits, right? You just have different functions that you have to consider. So there can be a lot of interplay between machine learning and theory and uh, we just ask slightly different questions but uh, we ask fundamental questions that should Eventually, they will have also an uh, effect on uh, machine learning. Another thing is that if you can attract people to theory and let them know that at some point they can go to machine learning and trash theory. And then uh, that's something you cannot do if you just go to machine learning. 
<laughs> but, but an interesting but the interplay between machine learning and say circuit or arithmetic complexity is that people ask these questions, you know, are neural nets of depth 20 better than neural nets of depth 30? And we realize that, you know, once you go beyond depth four, you know, and we have threshold gates or uh, we can't say anything really. So somehow the, the, the neural network community ignored, you know, our, maybe they think they're smarter than we were, but somehow they, they ignored our research and our inability to prove lower bounds for these things. Right, but that's uh, because we are talking about worst case versus, you know, where you have this distribution of inputs and uh, you only look at cats that are brown. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the explanation of this. But somehow, you know, you get into this statement that you know deeper neural networks are better than shallow neural networks. We we know very well that it's very hard to prove these things. But we also believe it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so this phenomenon that Madhu talked about, the loud noise drowning our voices. Do any of you worry about this in some other context, not just attracting students, but in some other ways uh, that this is happening already at your university? So just to underline, I think we have uh, different countries represented here and perhaps the way we perceive machine learning is also sort of uh, uh, different. So Madhu is from the US, uh, Shubhangi recently moved to uh, Canada and then uh, Johan is from Sweden and uh, Amir is from Israel. So I think the influences, influence of this phenomenon is reaching perhaps differently in different universities. This could also be the case perhaps, but um, have any of you experienced this, what Madhu was trying to say, the drowning of the voices or it's not something to worry about? This is something constantly to worry about, that, you know, society gets focused on one point, you know, the, suddenly, I mean, some major event in the world and then everything else is forgotten somehow. It's, uh, so, yeah, no, it is a problem that, but, but that's a deeper problem. That's sort of the media, how the me logic of the media works. Got it, yeah. <laughs> yes. So maybe we move the mic around a bit, uh, one of the mics maybe. Yeah, so I was just going to say we have yapped around long enough. Let's open it up for the audience. Okay, so you know, perfect. I just, I'm wondering, like this is a constant tension that happens in last couple of years in my department. I wonder if it happens in your department and what do you say in that case? Um, so there's a constant pressure, like in Israel we teach lots of math in undergrad. Uh, there is a constant pressure to teach less discrete math less abstract algebra, more analysis, more uh, uh, continuous uh, analysis, probability now is taught in a new way, no discrete probability, only continuous probability. Now they want to, in algebra not to teach groups, not to teach rings, uh, teach just, uh, I don't know, algebra of the reals, things like that, I hope. I, I wonder if it happens in your departments. And what do you do in that case? I mean, and my fear is always like if students will be taught only this, then later they will have problem entering theoretical computer science because we use lots of discrete math, lots of abstract algebra. And so, so there were a couple of questions blended in there. Let me. One is, uh, what is it that we want to teach, uh, and are we being forced into teaching something that we don't want to? And the other is, what do we expect our students to know? and are they going to know enough of what we want them to know? On the latter, I can, I'm pretty confident, a student who's good at math and does math in the, in the way we like it, not just whether it's discrete math or continuous, but really are they able to separate axioms and actual proofs from a calculus and uh, an execution of an algorithm? Uh, that difference, I think, uh, so, so as long as the students are learning good math, I think they're gonna be great raw material for us to work with. I have no concerns on that front. Yes, they will be, have to be taught something, but then we are still teaching them. I don't know, maybe they come in with 10% of the background that's necessary for their PhD, they will be coming in with 5% or maybe less. One thing that happens when they are taught all this kind of math, they, it's more like computational, less um, theorem-based. You see what I mean? So they know less to prove, less to... Right. I mean, so that's what I meant by this calculus of, you know, oh, if you apply this function to that function, then you'll get this. But no explanations on why and how and, you know, what can you, what else can it do? Uh, we, uh, yes, we, you know, 
on the one hand, yes, we would love to have them know it, but on the other hand, I think already going across different nations, I mean, in, in US, a computer science degree will probably involve two courses that involve some form of proofs in discrete math. One course on algorithms, one on a theory of computing, or maybe a discrete math. That's it. I mean, two courses worth of material people can pick up, but the, the quality that it's measuring is whether you are able to reason carefully and formally, which is very important. I do want to see it. We will have to filter for that. Uh, maybe somebody else wants to talk about the... Experiences at the... Whether uh, there are pressures on how to, uh, what courses you should teach. Well, I, I agree that sort of mathematical maturity and sort of the ability to think about your results. I'm, I mean, I've been, one of the things I do at KTH is supervising master thesis that's usually done in industry. And lo lots of them is applying machine learning to some problem. And way too many of these just, you know, take some standard tools and uh, take their data and feed it in and then have no sort of idea of how trustworthy the results are. And I don't think the problem there is if whether they did, you know, multivariate calculus or they did discrete math, but somehow you need to raise their level of mathematical maturity and how to do that is a very difficult question. Yeah, so um, I can speak about what happens at Tel Aviv University, but uh, something more general that, uh, as I said, um, at least in algebraic complexity, at least if you look at the geometric complexity program, then more and more sophisticated math is needed and it goes well beyond what you study at undergraduate. So really, maybe we should, I mean, at least I want to work with students that also has, have math degree, uh, because the math that we teach in computer science is, is at, I mean, in Israel it's great, but even this is not enough. Yeah. So, I mean, as Johan and Madhu said, and we, we need people with uh, uh, math maturity, and then they should teach, uh, should learn the math uh, that, the, that is needed. Now, about specific courses in uh, Tel Aviv, so. <laughs> Okay, so there's um, the last couple of years we started thinking about some of the classes, like, um, I mean, we teach in the first year two algebra classes and two calculus classes. And, uh, and we have two kinds of algebra classes and two kinds of calculus classes. One that is like pure math and one that is more, I would not say applied, but with less proofs, uh, some proofs, but not uh, everything is a proof. As a proof, and, Nowadays, we are thinking about how to make them so that they will be more applicable, like change the calculus to speak maybe about gradient descent, something we did not have earlier. So this thing, I, th I think it's fine. I mean, it's uh, completely fine. Just, you know, you, if you teach theorems, then continue teaching theorems. If you show just the spirit of things, then why not do it in an applicable way? And uh, so I don't see a problem with this uh, either. And in any case, I think Israel is very different because uh, Madhu said like two classes, so I already mentioned four. We also have a discrete math class. We also have a logic class. We have an algorithms class, a model of computations class, and the complexity class. So that's why we try to win it these days. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, yeah. yeah. So maybe we also open it for more questions from the audience. So takes a minute. To so, uh, so my life uh, was completely changed after I know uh, the Goethe's theorem. Uh, basically, uh, it tells me that the truth and the beauty of the world cannot be completely approached by logical thinking. Um, for me, that's the case. Uh, so I'm wondering, how do you think about this? And how are you trying to understand this world? Um, so I guess it's, yeah, I mean, what's the role of logic and aesthetics, uh, maybe in some senses? Does uh, an incompleteness theorem tell us that there's some fundamental flaw in logic? or? Uh, is it telling us that logic is amazing? To me, I have, I mean, my perspective on the sort of theory of completeness over here comes from the perspective of computer science where it manifests itself in the form principle of universality. You have the ability to communicate actions by words. 
So your data can be an action, can represent an action. This gives me wonderful insights into being able to understand human beings. And uh, there is a good reason that there is a limit. I mean, if I can understand everybody else and everybody else can understand me, then we can obviously, there should be a limit or else I should, can try to contradict whatever you're doing and you can contradict whatever we are doing. So uh, I think it is an inherent truth. Um, so the fact that there is Gödel's completeness and incompleteness theorems, those are wonderful statements to me. I think these somehow complete my understanding of the world of logic and its powers. Uh, it is not in any, I do not view these as any way limitations on the ability of reasoning. It is merely telling us what, what we should be capable, you know, what we can be capable of and what we should be aware of. Um, so I, I, I think of these as wonderful theorems. They drive us, they help us understand all forms of processes around us which are far more complex than we would have expected to understand with elementary, uh, uh, you know, linear algebra or something. Any other comments about Gödel's theorems? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, when I heard about Gödel's theorem uh, as a uh, high school student, I mean, just, you know, as a popular uh, science kind of thing, it was shocking. But then you hear about the halting theorem. And uh, you realize that, uh, I mean, yes, there are algorithmic questions that we cannot solve, that cannot be solved, that it's probably cannot be solved. And it's not surprising when you see the proofs and learn computer science. And in that, from that respect, I think that uh, Gödel's theorem is, is truly beautiful, and, but it's just uh, another manifestation of the uh, Alting theorem, or at least in spirit, uh, from my perspective. So, um, and and computer science gave us so many beautiful theorems that say fundamental things about the world, like the power of interaction. I think IP equals P space is the, maybe the theorem that I like the most, that really proves that interaction gives you power that you could not get in any other way. And uh, I think that's a very nice statement uh, that I also always try to explain to students. Like That's the beauty, part of the beauty in computer science that you are able to say such beautiful things about the world in completely mathematical terms. Are there other uh, questions? Yes. Hi, Venkatesh. Hi. Uh, not a question, but more like a comment, uh, request of Devdat and so on. I am, um, yeah, I guess, I guess there's a lot of attention now for computer science and machine learning. And, you know, so you phrase the question as a little bit as of like, it's not necessarily a zero sum game with theory because in some sense, we should feel happy that now computer science is getting all the attention in the media, like you know, more than physics or biology or other things. So that's uh, that's a great thing, and we can kind of embrace this. And and just want a couple of data points on this from the perspective of the Simons Institute, where I am at right now. Um, there is a workshop on large language models just this week. I guess with the time difference, it's probably starting in a couple of hours uh, <laughs> at the Simons Institute, and it's a very exciting program and. Um, you know, it'll be there for the world to watch. And, you know, in, in doing this, are they, from the theory perspective, we are actually saying that this is something we embrace. Uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting, it's clearly already empirically has done amazing things. And we would love to understand what its potential is, what its limitation is, basically bringing this, you know, this theoretical mode of study and lens on it, which the panelists have already uh, commented on. And, and there are going to be more such, prog there were already many programs at the interface between ML and theory, and there will be more in the, the coming years. So I think there is, theory has always been very agile in sort of recognizing where it needs to move, where our way of thinking can be really potent, and uh, has an immense track record in that regard in areas like security, verification, and you name it. And I'm sure it'll happen in machine learning too, and indeed, many of like very prominent top theorists have already kind of gravitated a little bit towards machine learning. Now we can sort of lament on that and say, oh, these people, you know, we have kind of lost them a little bit or at some percentage of their time. But we can also say that we are exporting great talent to these other fields. And, and now computer science departments overall, my feeling is theorists, uh, at least from the perspective of say American academia, theory people are really respected inside computer science department because of this agility and recognizing that we live in a greater world where, and we are part of a computer science department. So 
So I think there's a lot of positive things with, for all the attention which computer science machine learning gets. And I think theory can and I think will find a way to embrace this. And I think we should look forward to it. So just wanted to say that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Venkat. I think we have to realize that we're sort of cheap and small. I mean, comparing the cost of all theory research to the cost of development, developing chat GPT is, we're, I don't know, we're off by a, a large factor. So if we can ever have any impact on these things, we, you know, and we, we can and we have in, in previous years, I, I think we should be happy. Are there more questions coming from the audience? So then maybe I ask uh, like one maybe penultimate or ultimate kind of a question, but uh, just to wrap up, so we've spent quite a lot of time talking. I uh, don't want to keep you beyond the designated time. Um, but to sort of wrap up, I wanted to ask um, a few things about uh, theory. So uh, because we have representation from many countries here, um, I would just like to uh, see what your thoughts are about students. So we have some students here. We will have students listening to this. Um, what's a good uh, path for uh, theory students going forward? So in your individual countries and in general, so uh, how does one... So at every stage in research career, we need some sort of advice, uh, right? So as research students, we need probably maximum amount of guidance and advice. But even through uh, different uh, stages of your career, when you go from one to the other, you kind of the landscape changes a little bit. So based on your experience, what are the best ways to navigate some of the stages, whichever stage you think is the most relevant from your point of view and so how? Be before trying to answer this, what are we optimizing here? Yeah, so so what, what's the measure of progress? I mean, is it sort of the individual happiness of the student or is it the, what's so good So that for is very hard to optimize, I would say, but what would be the <laughs> I mean then giving advice is very difficult because that really depends on the personality but I would say for theory it's good if talent stays so, so maybe we're optimizing the development of theory that's what you want us to do or retaining the brains that we receive at, at the beginning of the pipeline somehow uh, you know so I don't yeah, know. I'm it's going to solve that optimization problem no, optimally <laughs> in a few minutes. But in the we meanwhile, know this is NP hard. <laughs> meanwhile, I will act as a function which has no inputs and only gives output <laughs> because I don't care what the rest of the world wants. I want to optimize my happiness with all my uh, <laughs> advising and so on. And uh, okay, firstly, my view of research is we are sort of deposited in some random spot in some unknown landscape and we just do random walks and at each moment of time we might find something interesting or not and we try to develop our own sense of smell and truth and uh, appreciation and try to wander towards you know more and more interesting terrains and if we are good researchers we should not inhibit the inherent randomness that uh, any student can exhibit, we don't want to con control it, we just want to say, okay, if this place has been well explored, yes, it's been well explored. Uh, if this terrain looks like some other terrain, look, you know, there may be similarities, etc. We guide them, but we never direct them. Uh, and <clears throat> I've been very successful with this part, very fortunate with this part, which is the best thing that you want your students to do is to teach you something, okay? And I've will hand over to Shubhangi, who's taught me a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> Shubhangi is Madhu's student, and so is Venkat, and so is Vastik, who'll speak tomorrow, and Prahlad, who couldn't be here. So, yeah, Madhu speaks from experience. <laughs> I see, once, one thing, one thing Madhu did... So, I think when the first day I asked Madhu to be my advisor, so one thing he told me, so in this advice I really helped me in my PhD time. Like, there was so much of lack of pressure. He told me, look, when I was a student, it took me maybe three years till I had my first publication. So don't feel pressured to try um, to get a result. And that freedom was really liberating. I did not um, feel any kind of pressure. I, Madhu even encouraged like talking to lots of people, traveling, visiting, and uh, into the, the, the experience of just exploration in the first couple of years without any kind of expectation or pressure 
was really, really nice. Like, just to be able to do research, you need to enjoy the, the experience of collaboration and um, just talking to different people, learning from different people. It's a random walk, and that to have the freedom to do the random walk, I think, was, is really nice to have. And I do encourage, or whenever I can, my students to also just like to have to explore research in different ways, talking to different people, knowing when to give up on a not when to give up on a question and try to think of something else. Like in the early days, just to get a feel for the kinds of questions they like working on, I think was, it was very valuable to me, and I, I don't know, I think that's a good lesson to pass on. Well, I, I think advising is a little bit more complicated than this, because it's the bias of the survivors, right? You throw people into the river and, uh, that can't <laughs> swim, and some people survive, and then they tell you this is a story that this was a wonderful way to learn how to swim. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I cannot overshadow what you all just said. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, but I agree with everything that uh, was said here. Um, I mean, there's no, there shouldn't be a pressure to publish right away. And I think the most interesting part is uh, that students find questions that really interest them. Because, um, I mean, there's no point in doing uninteresting stuff and not getting money for it. If you want to do something not interesting, go work for the industry. So, <laughs> so no. So if you want to do research, really find the problems that interest you, even if it's not popular, or just do what you like. And uh, sometimes uh, very nice things come out of it. So, uh, yeah, just encourage students to be themselves in some sense, and, uh, and no pressure in publication. Any comments from the audience based on this? But if not. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to everyone.